God be with you. We welcome you to worship this morning. And uh, if you all were not here last week, it was only last week, um, we had our candidate for uh, our new minister last week, and it was glorious, and he was voted in unanimously, and he will be here the first Sunday of March. So prepare yourselves, uh, get ready to welcome him. Um, if you are interested in knowing the news of the church, you'll notice it's not in the bulletin, but it is online, and you can sign up to get that. So uh, we welcome you to do that. After the service, there is a coffee hour. You can see the urns in the back. Do not jump the gun. Wait until the end of service, and then we'll all talk and have a good old time. Um, are there any other announcements? Any other announcements? If you are visiting with us, we hope you feel warmly welcomed. Uh, this is a congregation of very caring folks. And I notice that the chime is not out, but I found its hiding place. Therefore, let us take a moment to center and open ourselves to God. Good morning. Amidst the wonder of your good creation, we gather, gather to, to worship, worship in gratitude. gratitude. Amidst the support of this community of faith, we, we gather, gather to celebrate in joy. and joy. Amidst the challenges of our world, we, we gather, gather to find meaning for the journey. journey. Let us worship our God in gratitude, joy, and with deep meaning. Let us pray. Oh God, you have called us together. You have gathered us in this place. Whether it is a virtual place or whether we are in the sanctuary, we are together. We are your community of people. And we are grateful for this calling upon our lives, for the opportunity to be with one another and to be in your presence. We pray today that all that distracts, all that worries us may for a moment be released or permanently released, that we might gather and hear your word proclaimed, that we might sing hymns of joy, that we might offer prayers and be joyful in your presence. In your name we pray, amen. Let us uh, join in our opening hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Please stand.
Be thou my vision, O oh. now our prayer of confession. God of imagination and awe, with all the news of war abroad and misinformation at home, with hate being fomented and polarization weighing heavy on our hearts, we seem to have no good options. Remind us again that you are in the midst of it all. Help us from looking for simple solutions. Help us catch a vision of the dignity of all people and empower us to work it, make that a reality. We pray, amen. In front of us, behind us, to our right, to our left, God is there. In our past, beside us today, in the future, God is there. In the shadows, in the light, God is there. Thank you. And in this place of forgiveness and peace, let us pass the peace of Christ to one another. So the peace of Christ be with you all. Peace be with you guys. Hi. Peace be with you. Hello, Peace everybody. be with you. Hi, Don. Hi, Suki and Wacha. Well, I just see Wacha. Hi, Bunny Rabbit. Hi, Sonia. Hi, Sonia. Hi, Thank you. I'm okay. staying oh much God. of pain with the medications. <laughs> I may not be so good to see you. Take <laughs> those drugs. They're the answer. Yeah, that's it right now. Thank you.
<laughs> Much love to everybody. Good to see you all. Good to see yes, you. love Good to life. everybody. Yes. Hi, yes. Leela. Hi, Leela. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, here is truly an Israelite in which there is no deceit. Jesus answered, and oh, Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Thanks be to God. Between the last time you saw me stand before you, which was Christmas Eve, and now you have called a pastor. And the calling of that pastor takes place in the context of your calling to follow Jesus. Now, a calling is a beckoning. It is a voice. It is a calling forth. And we capsulize that in vocation. I mean, that's how Protestants do this. You have a vocation, which is what you're called to do, and you have a job or work that you do to keep yourself together physically. But remember, you keep yourself together spiritually through your vocation. And so I thought today we might look at what does it mean to be called? The scripture lessons today is about the calling of Nathaniel. And let me give you a little background. After John begins with this glorious statements about the Logos becoming flesh, when we get back down to earth, there we counter John the Baptist. And the rulers in Jerusalem have sent people to question John. Now they say, who are you? But I suspect they said it more like, who are you? And John says, are you, the, are you the anointed one for these times? We read it as Christ, but you should really hear it as the anointed one for these crimes, these times. And John says, no, 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 that's not me. All I do is wash off the crud. I make the way. I get prepared the way for something bigger than this to come. Something that calls you to your vocation, but that's not me. I'm just washing the way. Remember, to decide means to cut. So you cut things off so that you can do other things. You make a decision so you can do other things, but it means a loss as well. And so the next day, when John sees Jesus coming to him, toward him, he said, there it is. There it is. That is the vocation. That is the way that is leading us forth. Two of the disciples of John were kind of impressed with Jesus. And they ask him, where are you staying? 
they don't really tell us, but they follow him and they spend the rest of the day with him. The next day, the next day, Andrew goes to his brother, Simon, you know that, the Simon who is not yet Peter, and says, you ought to come see this. See, Simon says, okay, okay. He comes and sees Jesus, and Jesus gives him a new maid. He says, I'm going to call you Rock, which means Peter or Cephas. I'm going to call you Rock. And then Andrew also goes and gets Philip. He says, you got to come see this too. Philip too is impressed. He goes to Nathaniel and says, you ought to come here. And Nathaniel responds, nothing good's going to come out of Nazareth. Now, you need to hear the profound skepticism and cynicism in that comment. Nothing's good's coming out of here. Think about that. Hear that a lot often today? You hear it everywhere. Because as you said in the affirmation of faith, there is polarization, there is division, there is hate. And I want to suggest to you that at the depths of that is a deep cynicism that anything can change. That there's not anything new that can happen here. And so Nathaniel responds back, hey, nothing good going to happen here. Yet, Philip convinces him to come take a look. Now, what does he do? Go sits under a tree. And Jesus sees him and says, there is an Israelite who is without deceit. I want to unpack that a bit for you. What is an Israelite? An Israelite is a person who lives and struggles to exist and to keep his soul intact amidst absolute collapse. Now, I wasn't taught this in seminary. I was given bits and pieces. But since then, and I guess historians have kind of put it together that way, that this is, takes place in the collapse of the late Bronze Age. To give you a little bit of what that's like, cities fall apart and they don't get rebuilt. Agriculture and irrigation fall apart and they don't get rebuilt. Empires collapse, and what you're left with is gangs fighting each other. This sounds a bit like Haiti, or a bit like some of the situations in Central America. It should, because it represents exactly that kind of chaos and breakdown. Now, it is in that context that the entire Old Testament takes place. From Abraham's wandering to the Israelites walking out of Egypt to the rise of the prophets and the judges and even David. Think about David. You ought to think in your head, warlord, gang leader, because it's pretty close to that. And so they're there struggling to find a way to exist in times that are deeply uncertain. And not simply to exist, but to keep your soul intact. That's what it means to be an Israelite. Because that where Sam, that's where Nathaniel was. Remember, this takes place in John, at least, in Bethsaida. Bethsaida. And Bethsaida is at the north part of the Sea of Galilee. And what it is, is the place where the fish that they caught out of Galilee was then dried and put into the crossroads that took it back to those in the Roman Empire who just loved dried fish. That was one of the ways that you could make it if you didn't have any other way to go. And so at that, that point, you have Simon, Peter, and Andrew fishing. They're not have a boat to fish. They're standing in the water because that's all they got, trying to get some fish here so we can make it through today. Remember, Bethsaida is one of the places suggested that the feeding of the 5,000 
takes place. Now, this is also a place where there is great diversions. Because if you were involved in the trading of this fish, you did pretty well. If you were on the side of trying to get the fish there, you weren't doing well at all. And Nathaniel's, because he is a friend of Philip, who is a friend of Simon and Peter, or I guess they're the same people, Andrew and Peter, he's on the lower end of this as well. And so what's he doing sitting under a tree? Well, he's sitting there because, like the old man said, what are you doing when you fish? Well, sometimes I fish, I just sit and think, and sometimes I just sit. But what he's not doing is anything. He's stumped because the old no longer works, and the new is nowhere in sight. And so Jesus says, you're not only an Israelite. You are an Israelite without deceit. What in the world can that mean? We usually think of deceit having mean trickery, as somehow or another fooling, somehow or another not. The best way to approach this stuff, and I'm going to be on shaky grounds here, is through a book written by Harry Frankfurt called On Bullshit. And he defines bullshit as the art of persuasion without regard for the truth. And so you can imagine Nathaniel sitting there and saying, this is just all bullshit. Okay? But there's a deeper meaning to deceit. And I want to suggest to you that what deceit means is, I'm going to convince you that by my pursuing my interest, by my pursuing my ambitions, my interest, my well-being, I'm going to further yours. That's the deceit of what we call neoliberalism, and it's taken our country. I don't have to be concerned about you. I only have to be concerned about what I want, and I know that'll work out for you well. That is deceit. That is deceit. And so Jesus says to that deceit, here is the possibility. Here is a new way. You can do things differently, and I'm going to show you how. This Sunday is Martin Luther King Sunday. I suppose that's what we call it now. It's his birthday, I think, tomorrow. There'll be celebrations. The legacy of Martin Luther King can be found, and I encourage you to read it, in the lecture, the Nobel lecture that he gave. Not the acceptance speech, that's good in and of itself, but go to, the, uh, go to the web and find the lecture, the Nobel lecture that Martin Luther King said, and listen to it. In that, he said, we face a serious situation, and it is a political and a moral situation. We have three that are at the core, war, poverty, and racial justice. And these are not just political, although they are political, because he spoke to a particular legislative agenda. It was the time when the Civil Rights Act had passed, but the Voting Rights Act had not. It was a time when the, es when the Vietnam War was escalating secretly. It was also a time when people were taking to the streets to protest the comprehensive test, or protest for the comprehensive test ban. And it was a time when the great society was just taking off. And so in saying this, he was speaking to a spiritual, I mean, a, a, a political agenda. But he was also speaking to a moral agenda. Because he said that the, the source of these problems that we have to address is that we don't yet know how to live with one another. We don't yet know how to live with one another. Now, I don't have time to spell this out. We'd be here until 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 
which would be all right for me, but I don't expect it would be all right for you. But I want to suggest that what it means to live an agape, a life structured by agape, there's three things. It may mean more than that, but it at least means these three. That I live a life, I live a vocation, I live a calling that fosters dignity. I lead a life, I lead a calling, I leave a vocation that safeguards livelihoods. I lead a life, I lead a calling, I lead a vocation which encourages respect. The difference between dignity and respect is dignity is how I think about myself, respect is how I think about you. But in my life, in my calling, that's what I am doing. And I also don't have time to, to detail and uh, develop how it is that those things make a sharing of a future possible. And the sharing of that future does not mean that we agree. It means that we can live with those who, whom we disagree safely, honestly, without deceit. So I get moved when I hear about the King legacy, but that's not all that's there. Of course, the words that really piss my, pierce my heart are those that are found in the preface of Strides Toward Freedom. Now, I knew these before just a little bit. I couldn't find them. I couldn't find them at all. I kept looking in my books. They just were nowhere. I did word searches. I couldn't find them at all. Turns out that the copy I had left off the preface, and that's where it is. And in that preface, King says, the civil rights movement is not a drama about one person. It is a chronicle of a people, five, 50,000, and he said Negroes, we might just say people, who undertook through the principles of nonviolence and through the weapon of war of love, sought a new, sought a transformation of our rights and came, this is what the point, important point is, and came to a new estimation of their human worth. Think about that. When Jesus called Nathaniel, he said, here's a way. I'm going to overcome your skepticism. I'm going to present and open the world to you. And here's how you get that. You get there by love. Now, there are a couple of theories of what nonviolence is. But the ones that I like to t compare are those of Gene Sharp and those of Martin Luther King. Gene Sharp took a more cynical view. It's just power. Nonviolence is a way to withdraw consent. It's a way we do politics. We're out to win. And there's some important parts of that to remember. But King understood that it wasn't that. It was about a transformation that it had to have not politics, it also had to have love. He said, I sure am glad that my Savior called me to love those folks, because it'd be awful hard to like them. And I think that's where we are. That's where we find ourselves today. And so when we look back to the Civil Rights Movement, what do you remember? What do you remember? Singing. They sang. Now I want to tell you that I need your help in this because I think we all have to sing. I once sat in a congregation waiting for the service to, to begin. It was at Allen Temple in Oakland. I forget what the service was for, but it was Lissy and I sitting there. We were about the only people in the pews yet because the service was a little bit ways off. We'd driven up, gotten early. The choir was practicing. They were uh, doing just great, in my opinion. And right in the middle of a song, he stopped. 
And he said, I didn't think I'd, the choir leader, I didn't think I'd have to tell you this. But you're just not singing a song. You're singing for Jesus. And that changed the whole thing. I realized that I don't have the voice that can sing like some of you can here. I tried it out. Not going to work. So I need your help. I need the help of the choir. Come on up. And I need the help of you because I can't do it. I don't have the skills. But as I sat there and heard this, I knew I didn't have to have the skills. I don't have to have a voice that can sing in harmony, a voice that can stand out and boom to the congregation. I just need to sing in my heart. And so I need your help in order to do that. I've already alerted the choir that they're not up here because they're singing to you or they're singing for you. It's because they're leading you in song. And for you to be led in song, you got to stand up. All right, come on. Stand up if you can. And get ready. Because I can imagine Nathaniel sitting there and Jesus saying, come for, come sing with me. And what comes to mind when they do that is, oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When Jesus washed the crud of the Roman Empire off of me, and not only that, put a song in my heart that leads me to the kind of life that opens up the world. And so, Andy, I need you. Sing. Let's go.
attention to that chorus that kept popping up and we kept ignoring. Because what makes it a happy day is how he taught us to watch, to fight with love, and to pray, and to live rejoicing each and every day. So think of Nathaniel, and think of yourself, and think of this church in the next couple of months as we learn together how to watch, how to fight with love, not hate, and to pray so that we might live rejoicing each and every day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. The new that is not yet here is coming. It's budding in our hearts. And so wash that crud away. Happy day. It is a very happy day. Thank you, Byron. That was a wonderful message for me, at least. Um, and I love Oh Happy Day, and it eradicates the next hymn. So just hold on to the happy day and um, we thank you for supporting the church during this time. And if you want to give online, there are all sorts of ways to do that. And you can look online to see how there is also a bowl, a beautiful bowl made by Jeff Vamos, or it looks like that, uh, that you can put your offering in today if you, if you would prefer that. Um, and now we get to hear from the choir again. The choir will sing Tumamina, and following on what Byron is saying, Tumamina, a South African song meaning freedom is coming. <laughs> To Mamina, to Mamina, to Mamina, to Mamina, so manja, to Mamina, to Mamina, to Mamina, so manja.
Isn't it amazing? The desires of our hearts, our deepest yearnings. You know how we long for your shalom, your wholeness that you offer to each of us. We're just not sure how to get there from here. Guide us, we pray. Keep us from holding grudges and help us to let go of the hurts of the past that keep us from experiencing the joys of the present. We give great thanks for Mary Alice's return to her apartment from skilled nursing. We thank you that Melissa's brother, in law is no longer testing positive for COVID and pneumonia, though still in the hospital. May he return to full health soon. We thank you for Vita's successful knee replacement. May she regain full use of her knee, keep her from discouragement as she does the exercises that lead to healing. We pray for Byron's sister as she grieves the loss of her husband. Give her comfort. We pray for all those facing surgery this month, that the surgeries will lead to full health, calm fears, and give them skillful surgeons. We pray particularly this day for our new pastor, Tom Harris as he takes leave of his church of 17 years. May your light transform the painful parting of long established relationships, that new life may be found by the church and for Tom and his family. May we prepare a warm and welcoming homecoming here so that he can envision new possibilities we pray for the parts of the country enveloped in record-breaking cold that all may be safe. Be with those in war zones that they may be comforted in spite of the danger and chaos that surrounds them. We pray for Jack Schaup, who is hospitalized, that he may find healing in his stay there. As we await the new chapter that you have pre prepared for us at First Prez, help us to prepare our hearts and minds for the new thing that you are bringing. Let us be open to your surprises, yes, and perhaps even change. We pray this most humbly, amen. Now we move to the communion table. At this table, the reign of God exists. Here, all people are equal. Here, all people are loved. Here, you will find the nurture that you seek and yearn for. So this table is open to all, and we invite you to partake in its bounty. Please pray with me. God of all our lives, you called all creation into life, and we respond with gratitude. Shaping us in your image, you called us to live in joy and peace, gifting us with a garden as our refuge. But we strayed from your peaceable kingdom and decided we were right and our way should be followed forgetting the humility to which we are called, forgetting the dignity of the other. You sent prophets to call us back to your way, 
but we had no eyes to see or ears to hear. Finally, you sent your son, your beloved one, to show us your hopes and dreams for living fully, joyfully, the life we have been given. As we respond to his call to follow, we find that joy and peace within us that was planted long ago by you. We pray now that you pour out your breath of hope on this table, on these elements of bread and wine, that they may empower us to get up and go to those who are hungry and thirsty and in need of your peace. As we partake of this bread of life and this cup of hope, May we join our broken lives with yours so that we may know your healing and hope as we join our voices in saying the prayer which Jesus taught us, praying together as one in Christ. Our creator in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he blessed it and broke it, and gave it to those whom he loved, saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. And in like manner, took the cup. I want you to imagine that it was your cup that he took. The cup that you just finished drinking from. He took that cup, he says, this cup is the new covenant, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he handed it back to you. These are the gifts of God for the people of God, the table is set, and in, we invite you to come forward. We'll, do, we'll uh, celebrate communion by intinction, which means you take a piece of bread and you put it in the cup, and then you go out the side aisles and back to your seat. So come, the feast is set. There is gluten-free here in the middle if you need it.
Let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for calling us to the table. We give you thanks for the nourishment at this table. We give you thanks that you have brought us together, that you have called us beloved, that you have claimed us as your own. So send us out into the world this day with joy, with peace, and with hope. In your name we pray, amen. And now, go out into this good day, taking the love of Christ to all whom you meet, praying earnestly for God's kingdom to be here and ready to work for that. And as you go, take with you the deep love of God, the wide compassion of Christ, and the inspiration and encouragement of the Holy Spirit this day and each day. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>